Well, it is the Christmas season, and so we are spending these few weeks uh, reflecting upon and celebrating the coming of our, of our Lord Jesus. Um, we're doing so in, in anticipation, thinking not necessarily about His birth, but about the, the hope that was instilled in the people of God in the nation of Israel before Jesus, long before Jesus ever came. And so the title of the series is Hope of a Kingdom and Her King. And uh, we understand that when Jesus came to Bethlehem and was born as a baby and in his earthly ministry, he inaugurated his end times kingdom. That kingdom is not only future, but it is now today. He established that kingdom as, as he came to the earth and he is empowering now his, his servants members of that kingdom, as he's poured out his spirit from on high. We know in the Great Commission, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. But even before that, he would tell those around him, The kingdom of God is among you, and the kingdom of God has come upon you, and the kingdom of God is in your midst. But we understand that the Jews misunderstood the hope of that kingdom, at least in that day. Right? They wanted a geopolitical king to rule the nations and make everyone Jewish and see the Roman Empire overthrown. They wanted Caesar to bow the knee and, and, and the, the Jewish nation to rise as triumphant. But Jesus' kingdom is a, not of this world. Amen. It's largely a spiritual kingdom. Uh, Paul says that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. It is the word in prayer. Uh, he says in Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that our ultimate uh, foes, our spiritual foes, that the warfare that we wage is a spiritual warfare. And so Jesus is building that kingdom today through his church as he wields the sword of his spirit through his soldiers as hearts and minds are conquered. And so this message today, Lord willing, is a message of hope. That's the, that's the idea, at least the text is. I believe. Um, I said that we would look at Jesus from three angles. Last week was the triumphant king. This week is the bridegroom king, or the husband king, and his royal bride. The bridegroom king and his royal bride. So turn your Bible, please, to Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is where we'll be today. If you want to learn about Jesus, a great place to turn in the Bible is the Psalms, as he is everywhere throughout the Psalter. I'm going to read the entire Psalm to you, starting in verse 1. This is God's word for his church today. To the choir master, Psalm 45, to the choir master, according to lilies, a mascal of the sons of Korah, a love song. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach your awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies, the peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have, a, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. 
In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God, we do give you thanks and we do praise you for your glorious word that is a word that sanctifies our souls. And so, God, we come today as we sit under the preaching of your word uh, with a desire to bear fruit. We come today with a desire to profit from this word, to grow in the word. Uh, We desire to, to behold glory today in the face of Jesus Christ and leave this place transformed, Lord. We desire that our faith would be increased, Lord, that our hope would abound in Jesus. We desire that the knowledge of God would increase, that the knowledge of our duties as the bride of Christ would increase. Lord, we're up against many battles, even right now, many competitors that are vying for our hearts, our minds, our wills. And so we ask and pray in faith that all these be laid aside that you would help us, Lord, during this hour to to set our minds upon Jesus, Lord. We pray for the children and their their growing ability to sit and, and, and listen, and we pray that they too would glean from the preaching of the Word. We're, we're thankful, Lord, that you have them here with us in our midst. We pray for us all, God, that we would hear the Word with gladness, receive it with hearts that are excited to obey, excited to put it into practice. So help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the psalmist we read the, in, in the superscript or the subscription there, um, the, the words before verse 1, those words are important. Those words are in the Hebrew. They're part of the text, not the inserted words that your Bible may have from the translators such as the, the ESV says, why should I fear? No, sorry, wrong page here. Your throne, O God, is forever. Those are added by the translators, but the, the words there next to 45 are inspired words. They tell us something about this song, this psalm, and we read that it is a love song. This is something of a marriage ode, a wedding ode. And this could be a text that was used or that was sung at one of, one of David's marriages or one of Solomon's marriages. But I think that we'll quickly see that there are statements made, as we saw last week in Psalm 24, that could only be said about the true king, the Lord Jesus Christ. I do believe that this psalm is meant to instill some longing in the people of God. Longing in the day of the Israelites, but still longing in our day as the work of Jesus Christ has not been brought to its completion. I think we all long for good. We all long for something better. Uh, We long for hope. You know, we look around in this world and it's broken. It's filled with loss. It's filled with disease. It's filled with destruction. Our relationships are often difficult because of sin and the fall. We long to to see our bodies healed and renewed, but we all face day by day more and more the effects of the curse upon our mortal flesh. We turn on the news and maybe we ask ourselves, can I have real hope with all that I'm facing, with all that seems to be going on in the world? At times we long for justice. We see injustice abounds all around us. It seems that the wealthy and powerful seem to to do all that they want as they oppress the the little guy. Um, We see even in our day that evil is being celebrated and even codified into national law. If we're honest, we long for God's enemies to be overthrown, to, to, to repent or perish. We long for righteousness to rule the day. We long for God. We long for an assurance of His love. We long for a felt sense that though I fail and fall short, that though I am often not who I hoped that I would be, that my God is for me. My God is with me. My God loves me through the storm and builds me up in the trials. And we'll see today that the Lord is a mighty King. And he is blessed of God, ready and armed for battle, and he is committed to his royal bride. 
It is his bride for whom he fights, and it is his bride for whom he came in the incarnation to be born of the virgin. I didn't get my proposition on the, on the handout, but here it is. The big idea is this. Jesus, the, the husband king or the bridegroom king, goes to war on behalf of his royal bride, the church. Jesus, the husband king, goes to war on behalf of his royal bride, the church, subduing her enemies in an unbreakable covenant union. Subduing her enemies in an unbreakable covenant union. If you want that later, you can ask me for it. (laughs) We're going to see two main headings today. First the king and then his bride. First the king and then his bride. So let's get into the text again. The psalmist writes here to the choir master. This is a, a liturgical note of how this song was, was used in a, in, a, in a worship setting. According to Lily's, a mascal of the sons of Korah, a love song. Now, we don't often have all the context as to exactly what these things mean, but we understand a love song. Amen? We know what that means, right? And listen to what he says in the very first verse. I, I love him just sort of pouring forth praise. He says, My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. And so he has a heart that is overflowing. Love is abounding, if you will, because of the subject that he's about to speak upon. It causes his heart to overflow. He says, this is a pleasing theme that I'm about to undertake. And this idea of the pen of a ready scribe is a scribe, someone who's writing, who is very intimately acquainted with his subject matter, with the material he's writing on. He is ready to get after it, but the psalmist does not take up his pen. He takes up his tongue as he's ready to sing, and he addresses his words to the king. Now, this is the first question of interpretation, right? Who is this king that we're speaking about? If you have a a New King James in your lap or a New American Standard or an LSB or maybe some other translations, you will see that king there is capitalized in those translations. So those translators are showing us their hand immediately that they understand this king to be divine. They understand this king to be the Messiah. Of course, that capital K is not in the original Hebrew manuscript. But we read about this king that this is a love song. And I'm just going to say from the beginning that this king is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'll try to argue that a bit more. But this is a love song that speaks of the excellencies of Christ and his commitment to his bride, the church. And it's a song in the form of a marriage. In the form of a marriage. I might even say... Some people don't like this word, that this is something of an allegory, a prophecy of Christ and his church. Uh, I commit to you, I'm going to say this now before I forget, if you're looking for something edifying to read after church, maybe you spend some time in the word after church, take up the full version of Matthew Henry's commentary on Psalm 45. It's very rich. If you do that, you'll see that I, I... in a God-honoring way, gleaned from him today because it's, it's very rich and very helpful. Um, and so we see the king here. Firstly, in this love song, we see, number one, the king's beauty. The king's beauty. Look at verse 2. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. So so from the outset, we're not completely sure yet who this king is, but from the outset, the psalmist exalts this king over all of the sons of Adam. His eyes are set upon him. His, His heart is swelling up with this pleasing theme, and he says that this one is the fairest of them all. He is the most handsome of all the sons of men. He's exalting and elevating this man, this king, this one, above all other else. And we know that our Lord Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. He he had the Spirit of God without measure. He was the perfect man. If you want to know what a man is, right? look no further than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And if our view of a man does not align with the, the Christ of Scripture, then we need to go back to the Bible. Jesus as a man was bold and courageous and strong, but also Jesus as a man was meek and gentle and compassionate. Right? We see these various facets of the Lord Jesus Christ coming together. When we look to Jesus, we see the perfect picture of the image of God, untarnished by sin. And we read that he has grace upon his lips. Grace was poured on his lips. Now, remember, we're in the Psalms. This is poetic language, illustrative language. It's meant to communicate something to the mind as he speaks in sort of flowery language. Um, but I can't help but think of Luke chapter 4. Do you guys remember in Luke chapter 4, I maybe say this too much, but one of my favorite stories in the Bible where... Uh, Jesus goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and as was the custom, if there was a guest or a visiting rabbi, they might ask him to read that day from the Word of God. And whether providentially it was the text of the day, or Jesus opens up the scroll there, but he reads from Isaiah 61, right? And this is the text where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. To, to, bring, to bring good news to the poor and liberty to the captives. And then I love the scene there where, where Jesus sits down and the whole room is just locked on him with their eyes. Everyone is staring at Jesus and he says, this scripture today has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, we might think there that they would react often as the Jews did and cry out, blasphemy or something, right? Who does he think he is? But we actually read this in Luke 4, 22. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Grace is poured upon his lips. He spoke and preached words of grace. Matthew Henry says this, by his word, his promise, his gospel, the good will of God is made known to us and the good work of God is begun and carried on in us. Jesus received all grace from God and I, and I would add, and he bestows all grace upon men. And we read that he is blessed forever. He is blessed forever. One thing we know for certain right now at this point is that this king is a son of David. Because any true king of Israel had to be of the line of Judah and of the line of David. So this is one of David's sons, without a doubt, whether it may be David, Solomon, or another. But there's a promise given, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where we, in what we call the Davidic covenant, the covenant God made with David about his house or his dynasty and his legacy and his throne. And we read in verse 13, it says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now his is David's son. In the, in the text, we're not sure at that time who David's son is, but we read that there will be a son that will be blessed of God forever. His kingdom and his throne will be established forever. And the text says here that God has blessed this king forever. Many have been blessed of the Lord. We might raise our hand and say, Amen, I've been blessed of God, yes, but none like the Lord Jesus. He is blessed and exalted beyond measure. He is so blessed that through him all of the nations of the world will be blessed. He is the nation blesser. And so the king is the fairest, most gracious, and blessed of all men. Now Matthew Henry warns us here, and I think it's a helpful warning. He says the world and all of its charms are constantly seeking to draw our hearts away from Christ. The world and all of its charms. Have you experienced this, beloved? The, the lesser things, we know them to be inferior to Jesus. But they seek to tickle the ear and tickle the flesh and, and draw our hearts away from the Lord. The lust of the pride of things. And I might say even 
right now, or maybe for some even especially in the Christmas season. I said last week, boys and girls, something that I've been trying to help my children understand this past month is that presents are good, but Jesus is better. Amen? Christ is better. I know that it's hard when there's a Christmas tree and you have your, your, your shopping list and you're hopeful as a little one or as a big one to get something neat for Christmas. It's hard. It's a battle to get our mind off of the stuff and onto the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a fight that we face not just at Christmas, but, but every day of the year. That the charms of this world are seeking to draw the heart away from Jesus. This is a fight that we all battle with. And so we must, beloved, I think, constantly remind ourselves of the excellency of Christ. Of the worthiness of Jesus. Of the incredible grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us through His death and resurrection. Meditate on His kindness. Meditate on His, his long suffering with you, his patience before Christ, but even after Christ. Meditate on his humility to come down and to be a baby that was dependent upon his mother and to, to live a life of a common man and then to go to the cross for sinners. We must constantly guard our hearts from being drawn away by inferior things. We see first here the king and his beauty. Secondly, we see the king's battle readiness. The king's battle readiness. Verse 3, Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth in meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, the people's fall under you. Again, just as we saw last week in Psalm 24, that this king is a man of war. He is a man of war. Listen to what, uh, again, Matthew Henry says. He says, the royal bridegroom, or the royal husband, is a man of war. And his nuptials, his marital vows, do not excuse him from the battlefield. No, they bring him to the field of battle. For he is to rescue his spouse by the stroke of his sword to deliver her out of captivity, to conquer her and to conquer for her and then to marry her. There's a sermon wrapped up in that statement there. Jesus comes, the, the Messiah King comes by the stroke of his sword. He delivers his own out of their captivity, out of their enslavement. He then conquers us. Amen? He conquers our hearts. He causes us to joyfully bow the knee to King Jesus. And then He conquers for us, beginning here as He slices the enemies of our hearts. And then He marries us in a beautiful covenant union that will be consummated at the marriage supper of the Lamb in glory. And we see His battle readiness for His bride, firstly in His preparation. Verse 3, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. I like the, this, this title here for him. We'll, Lord willing, next week we'll be in Isaiah 9, and we'll see there that Jesus is called El Gabor, mighty God. Here he is Gabor, the mighty one. So that word El is added in Isaiah's text. But the mighty one, Gabor, girds a sword on his thigh. And we know as we read the book of Revelation and as we read uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God that King Jesus swings the sword of the Spirit. This is His Word, right? The law and the gospel. This Word, this sword that He has girded on His thigh is a word that causes souls to be made willing to bow to Christ. Has Christ slayed you with that sword, beloved? Has He made your soul willing to bow the knee, willing to submit to His authority and His kingship? It is this word that conquers the hearts of men and conquers nations of men. 
but it's also this word that speaks forth threatenings and judgments. It is also this sword that he has on his thigh that, that speaks to kings, that, that men must pay homage to him lest they perish in the way. In, John, not John, in Revelation chapter 1, John spoke of the resurrected, glorified Jesus who there had a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, we read. We read of this double-edged sword in Revelation 19, that he will strike down the nations with the sword of his spirit, the word of his power. Behold your mighty warrior husband king, church. Behold your bridegroom who, who goes forth to battle for his royal bride, the church. Next, we see his cause in verse 4. In your majesty, write out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Charles Spurgeon here says that truth will be ridiculed, meekness will be oppressed, and righteousness will be slain unless the God and the man in whom these precious things are incarnate shall arise for their vindication. And the king has risen for their vindication. His cause is truth, we read firstly. This world is filled with lies because it serves and bows the knee to the father of all lies. We see evil praised as good and good praised as evil. But we know that the word of God's truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, dispels all lies. Because it calls men to fall to their knees. It calls men to acknowledge their many sins before this thrice holy king. It calls men to be honest and open before the one to whom we will all give account on that day. I I warn you this day that the Bible declares that all will stand before God naked and exposed. There will be no yeah but or what if On that day, and Jesus warns even greater than that, that on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, look at all that I did in the name of Jesus. Look at my big ministry and all of my followers and all that we, quote unquote, did for your kingdom. And Jesus will say, depart from me. The the, the most awful words that any could hear, depart from me. I never knew you, you lawless worker of iniquity. His cause is truth, but his cause is also one of meekness. Jesus was not the man at that time that the Jews hoped for. They wanted a man to crush the Roman Empire, and yet Jesus was the man that was crushed because of our sin. And he would say in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But church, make no mistake about it, Jesus comes back. Not in the second time on a donkey, but on a great white horse. And he comes with a sword ready to judge the nations. But his cause is one of meekness. And his cause, we read, is one of righteousness. One of righteousness. Where do we look to see the righteousness of God on display for us? We might say the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, certainly. But God put his righteousness on display when he killed his own son to judge the sins of his people. He declared to the entire world that no sin will go unpunished. And thus the gospel reveals God's righteousness. That whether at the cross or on the day of judgment, every sin will be punished. Beloved, you want your sin to be dealt with by Jesus. Amen. You want your sin to be dealt with in this life, not the next. Because the word says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And if you bow and you confess in this life, it will be to your eternal joy and blessedness. But if you bow and you confess in the next life, it will be to your eternal shame. Church, do you long for truth in a world of lies? You know, we can't even turn on the TV or open up the newspaper, if they still make those today, or open up a news site on the internet and 
It's hard to trust a word that we read. Is this true? Is this not? This source says this. This source says this. I thought I trusted these folks. They've been shown to be liars. Do you long for meekness in a day of pride and boasting and arrogance, of constant self-promotion? Do you long for righteousness to abound? Pray that our bridegroom king, as Spurgeon says, would lay his almighty hand to the work of his grace. Pray that he might more and more take up this cause of truth, the cause of meekness, and the cause of righteousness. Pray earnestly that that he might take up this cause more and more in our day. That the king would come and, and stretch out his mighty hand with all of his power and vanquish his enemies. And we see his preparation, and we see his cause, and we see his victory in battle. In verse 5, your arrows are sharp in the hearts, in the heart of the king's enemies, the peoples fall under you. This is the hope that the, the bride of Jesus has. That all of his arrows will land. All of his weapons will hit their mark, if you will. I was recently watching something about Navy SEAL snipers. And these men are incredible. They're, they're, their training is incredible. They can sit on a scope for 8, 12 hours in 120 degree weather. And they, they, they hit their mark. But they sometimes miss. They're men. Right? As trained and incredible as they are, they are men. But Christ, his arrows always land. His kingdom will always advance according exactly to his plan. Spurgeon says, Christ never misses, whether for love or whether for vengeance. The arrow might pierce the heart that the sinner might come to saving faith, as we talked about Wednesday night, a faith that receives and rests upon Jesus. Or that arrow might hit the heart like Pharaoh's heart, where he is hardened and digs in his heels even more against the living God. Church, I know that today it may seem that God's enemies are getting a pass. We might pray at times, Lord, shoot some of those arrows today. We need some of those arrows. It might seem that his enemies are winning the day, but our great king misses not a single shot. He has a purpose as he raises up pharaohs, as they harden their heart against his kingdom, against his law, against what he has revealed to be goodness. Because he will glorify himself as he triumphantly tears down those pharaohs of our day. So we've seen the king's beauty. We've seen the king's battle readiness. Thirdly, we see the king's brilliant throne. His brilliant throne. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you With the oil of gladness beyond your companions, your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Now something changed here. We have this king identified with a new title. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, some of these other things may be able to be said about a human king, but without heavy qualification, this can only speak of one king. Amen? Spurgeon here, Spurgeon here says this, The psalmist cannot restrain his adoration. His enlightened eyes see in the royal husband of the church God. The God to be adored. The God that is reigning. The God that is reigning everlastingly. Blessed sight. Now now hear these words. This is an important statement from Spurgeon. Blind are the eyes that cannot see God in Jesus Christ. Blind are the eyes that cannot see God in Jesus Christ. Jesus asked his disciples one of the most important questions that a man could ever be asked. Who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? That's a question for us today. 
church. Who do we say that Jesus is? Boys and girls, who is Jesus? He's God, yes. He's the king, yes. He's the God-man. The only answer is God and man. And that answer, beloved, the answer to that answer, eternity hinges upon. Our eternal destiny hinges upon who we say that the Christ is, who we believe that Jesus is. But boys and girls, it's more than just saying the words. Amen? It's more than just knowing the truth. It's even more, as awesome as you guys are doing, it's even more than knowing all the catechism answers. Right? Because that truth has to leave the head and has to penetrate deep into the heart and transform the soul. We must confess that Jesus is Lord, but we have to believe with the heart. We have to receive and rest upon this Christ. And we read here that He is none other than God who has a throne that is forever. We see firstly that it is an eternal throne. His throne is forever. Again, we read in 2 Samuel 7.13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And the person there is David's son. And so in that day, we see that Israel is longing for David's greater son. Yes, they come out of Babylonian captivity. Yes, they even rebuild the temple. But there is no king seated on that throne in Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. They're longing for David's greater son, who will take David's throne and will rule there, the text says, with an eternal rule. And here we meet the king that will sit on the throne forever. We also learn that this is a holy throne that he is seated upon. His scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of uprightness, and he loves righteousness, and he hates wickedness. Is this not the king that we all long for, church? Is this not the one that we want to elect on election day? Is this not the one we wish would be on the the, the paper at the ballot? We look around and we see chaos and we see perversion. The world causes us, I think rightly so, grief in our heart. But we see this glorious king who loves perfectly righteousness, who hates perfectly wickedness. The scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. And I do, with my brother, praise the Lord for our brother Dusty Devers, who on his whatever media picture says clearly, Christ is Lord. (laughs) I mean, I just can't even believe that. Who... Who has said that? What politician has actually, truly bowed the knee truly to Christ? Not just in some tacit confession. Praise God. May God bless this man. It's also a blessed throne that he's on. A blessed throne that he's on. God has anointed him with gladness beyond his companions. He is full of gladness and he is anointed. Or literally, the text could say there, He is Messiahed with the Spirit, and He makes His people glad. So church, behold your King. Behold the Blessed One. Behold His beauty. Behold His drawn sword, ready to defend your cause and to lead the way, as we saw last week, that He is the Lord of armies, Yahweh of hosts. Behold His brilliant throne of uprightness. The the fragrance and sweet aroma we read there of Christ. Behold that he is anointed with the Spirit beyond measure. He is glad beyond his companions. And as he read in that synagogue on the Sabbath day, he came to bring good news to the poor. He came to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. He came to open the prison for those that are bound and lost in their sin and depravity. He came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. He came to comfort all that mourn. What a comforter he is. He came to give a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. He came to give the oil of gladness instead of mourning. He came to give the garments of praise instead of a faint spirit. And I love this. This is all from Isaiah 61. 
that you may be called oaks of righteousness, planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. This is our King, beloved. This is our bridegroom King that defends our cause, King Jesus. And we see now the King's bride. The King's bride. And we see, firstly, the bride's duty. The bride's duty in verse 10. Hear, O daughter. So hear, O church. This is to us. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. Now we see, firstly, there's a call here for the church as the bride of Christ to renounce all others. To renounce all others. He says, leave your father's house. Forget your people. This is a call for us, beloved, to leave all behind for the sake of Jesus. What were you in your past life before Christ? What was your life about? Was it paganism? Maybe it was atheism. Maybe it was nominalism. You were a Christian in name only. But the church here is called to be exclusive to her husband, King Jesus. To pay a total and complete allegiance to our bridegroom. So renounce today, beloved, old ways. Don't linger in the gates of that old city where you once dwelt. Don't sit in that seat with the scoffers anymore. Don't keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church because the king of the church says, if you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out. I will spit you out. Cast off old attitudes, old practices, old mindsets, old beliefs, old things that get in the way of following completely and renouncing all else for King Jesus. This is your duty, beloved, as the bride of Christ. This is our duty. Just as in a covenant marriage, as we heard earlier, there is one man and one woman cleave together exclusively for life. The church is called to destroy all idols, anything that would compete for the heart's affection for God must be denied and rejected. Hear, O daughter, and consider the word of our Lord. And secondly, the bride's duty is to reverence the king. Since he is your Lord, worship him. That is sometimes translated, I believe it is in the King James tradition. This word, bow or worship, is a strong word of one lying prostrate on the floor before the Lord, kneeling in humble submission, bowing down in reverence and awe to the great King, the only one that is worthy of worship. Christ is worthy, church. Amen? Christ is worthy of our heartfelt, sincere worship. He doesn't desire worship outwardly, in action only. He doesn't desire worship out of bare duty. He doesn't desire worship that you perform to get mom and dad off of your back or your husband or your wife off of your back. He commands the heart and he rejects those that honor him with their lips but have a heart that is far from him. And I might add here, friend, the Lord knows your heart as you sit in this church today. If you're faking it, if you're a phony, if you're putting on an act, if you're living in sin, if you're doing this for anything else than a sincere worship of God, you must repent. Come to Him freely. Come to Him and be renewed. He commands that we worship Him in spirit, that is, from the heart and in truth according to the Bible. He desires worship that is from deep within. Young people that are here today, little people, 
older young people. Um, it is my hope and desire. This is just my personal hope and desire that as you grow up and eventually leave the house of your parents when you're 30 or 40 years old and go to live on your own and have your own car and your own bed and your own house, that you would stay in this church and worship the Lord with us. That you would, on your own, out of your own personal, sincere desire to love the Lord Jesus Christ and to be taught from His Word, would get up with your own alarm clock in your own house and get in your own car and come to worship simply because you want to worship the King. That's our desire for you guys. That you would love Jesus because He's worthy of being loved. And if your heart today is cold towards the Lord, if your heart is distant from God in this season, I exhort you to, to not pull back, but to feed diligently on the means of grace. You know, our flesh says when we're having a hard time, I just want to hide out. I just want to be alone. I just want to pull back. But the last thing that we need when we're cold or distant or struggling is to absent ourselves from the means of grace. Because these are central to what God is doing to build up His church. Amen? We need the people of God. We need the means of grace. Our flesh says, I want to go home and be by myself. Life is hard. But God says, join the people of God in worship and I will build you up. This is the duty of the church, that we forsake all and pay reverence to our King. So we see the bride's duty. Secondly, we see the bride's dignity. The bride's dignity. The people, verse 12, of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold in many colored robes. She is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her with joy and gladness. They are led along as they enter the palace of the king. This is the, the bride's dignity. The bride's dignity. First, look at her elevated place or status above men. The people of Tyre. This is a rich nation where trade was taking place. And it says that these people, the nations, the Gentiles, the people of the world, will, will pour forth gifts upon the bride of the king, upon the church. We know that as the nations, as people come to honor Christ, they will come and honor His bride if they truly know Him. They will see the church of Jesus Christ as one that is chosen and one that is precious. And I would say to any man, woman, or child that if you claim to love the bridegroom but do not love His bride, then you may not truly know the bridegroom because He died for His bride. And he is working in his bride and he is, he is pursuing her to, to build her up that on that day she might be spotless and blameless presented before him. Isaiah 43, for I am the Lord your God, verse 3, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes, honored and I love you. What a statement that God would make. We see her elevated place or status. We also see her precious robes that are lavished upon her, upon the bride. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. Beloved, God in Christ has given you the immeasurable riches of His grace. That is grace that cannot be counted or measured. He has clothed you with glory and splendor. He has filled you with His Spirit to serve and to enjoy Him forever. He has united you to Himself in covenant, in unbreakable covenant. And like Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah 3, you and I stood previously before God in filthy garments 
From head to toe, our garments were stained, our hands were stained with sin, our minds, our eyes, our hearts. We were thoroughly polluted by the corruption of our flesh, and we had no business being in the king's presence. And the king in his grace declared that those filthy garments would be removed. Zechariah 3. The king in his grace declared that you would be clothed with pure vestments. That that white robe of the righteousness of Jesus would be put upon your shoulders. And in his grace, beloved, you were made pure and clean, ready to be betrothed to your beloved. And we see thirdly her unique status in his presence. Notice, they enter the palace of the king. The bride has this incredible unique access to the throne of this royal bridegroom. Just like the queen is able to sit at the right hand of her king and has intimate access to him beyond maybe all others, the king has granted the church a seat at his table, a place in his house. As we sing in the song, Jesus, thank you. And so behold, beloved, the the church's dignity, the bride's Dignity. She is precious in the sight of her king. And we see thirdly, the bride's descendants. The bride's descendants. Verse 16. In the place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. And we read here that the descendants of Christ's royal bride will expand globally. The church is called to leave father and mother and to cleave to King Jesus. The the fathers, our fathers, are, are gone. Paul is gone. Peter is gone. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are gone. David is gone. They're in glory, right? But God in Christ has many more sons and daughters. We have many more brothers and sisters that he, is, that he is birthing, if you will, to come alongside in this glorious kingdom and to see it built. The king will have many sons, many seeds. The seed of the woman will advance against the seed of that serpent. And we read here that they will be his princes. They will be a royal seed. And they will be in all of the earth, leavening the world with the leaven of the gospel, growing and bearing fruit according to the providence and blessing of God. His seed will be many and his seed will be mighty. His seed may be despised in this world, but she, the church, will be filled with much power because we have his spirit. Listen to Isaiah 53, a text that we all love. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His offspring is the church. His offspring is those that he has purchased with his own blood. As the song says, from heaven he sought her. And it is on this earth that he bought her. And so beloved of Christ, royal bride of Jesus... Renounce all others. Renounce all other loves. Renounce all other devotions. Renounce all other idols. Renounce all other affections that compete for your whole soul devotion to Christ. And serve the Lord with fear. Worship your royal bridegroom. Bow before your betrothed. And give your whole soul allegiance and devotion to Him. Notice that the text said, Back in, um, if I can find it, it said that you will be precious in his sight or beautiful in his sight as you abandon all else. Seek him since he is your Lord. Then the king will desire your beauty. And so it is beautiful in the sight of the king when we renounce all idols and give ourselves in devotion to him. He is the faithful husband. 
that will never let down his bride. He protects her with the sword of the Spirit. He will defeat, beloved, your enemies. All of his arrows will hit their mark, whether it be for love, whether it be for vengeance. And see in the text, meditate today on your exalted position. You've been clothed with his robe. You've been, put, you've been given the, the ring in your ear. The fatted calf has been slain as the Lord delights in his beloved. And we see finally the king's eternal praise in verse 17. The king's eternal praise. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Church, fix your hope this season upon a kingdom and a king that will never fade, that will never fail, on a bridegroom that will never let you down, that will never forsake you. You will never have to wake up one day and wonder, am I still loved of God? Jesus has covenanted himself to you. He has pledged his eternal allegiance to you and he has shown his promise. He's given you a sign by sealing you with his spirit. Fix your hope on his eternal purpose that is being accomplished through his helpmate, the church. He has called you, his royal bride, to stand by his royal side. As he, Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of armies, advances the cause of his kingdom. He is the blessed one, the nation blesser. And his name will be remembered for all generations. And one day, pray to this end, beloved. One day, all will call him Lord. Amen. All will bow the knee to this blessed king. Let's pray.